In a crime-ridden Gotham City, Amanda Waller, the head of Argus, has assembled a group of notorious criminals for a mission. Harley Quinn, Deadshot, Peacemaker, Clayface, and King Shark. These DC supervillains are sent into an otherworldly realm that's connected to this world through a gate. It's a world of swords and magic where orcs rampage and dragons rule the skies and high sky. The interim starts with a girl who's talking about a new world that is different, where there is good food, killer music, and an extra fluffy bed. In fact, she's asking many people who look like hostages. Then a guy starts to answer her and he tells her that he will do anything. It turns out the girl's name is Harley, and Harley tells him that she will take him to a new world. Then there are some workers. They are preparing something and they inform Amanda Waller that they are ready. Not so long after that, the police come and about to save the hostages. But when the police are about to rescue them, there is an explosion. And Harley and a guy named Joker are in a car. They say that they are just getting started. After that, Joker tells her to consider the prelude to a very long show. But soon, the police are chasing them. When the police are about to shoot them, Harley uses her gun faster, and there is an explosion again. Then Joker talks about a new world that is music to his ears and he continues to drive. It seems like they steal a lot of money. Joker gives the money to the people on the streets. He mentions how the modern world is so ugly and unfair. Back to Amanda Waller, it seems there is something wrong. It turns out the power output is lower than they expected, so it won't last. Amanda then orders to increase the load, but an old guy says it would put too much strain on her, but is not known yet who she is in the scene. Amanda answers by saying there is no her, but just a tool to open the gate. She orders again to increase the load. Then there is a scene about Joker again. Joker seems to agree and talks about how even people who are sitting pretty in good every day and bossing around the countless minions also agree. Harley then asks if they want to blow the pop stand and go someplace else. It turns out the police are still chasing them, and Harley attacks them with another weapon. And there is an explosion again. Joker continues to talk, he says it is because their soul or their existence is screaming on the inside and saying, this isn't who I really am. But nobody ever takes the leap and that is why Joker and Harley are going to change things. They will use whatever it takes whether it's guns or money, which Joker calls as scraps of paper, and change the world. But suddenly, the car stops and Harley asks Joker to enjoy a drink before they change the world because changing the world is a tough job. She asks him to hang a bit and stops by in a bar. She then walks to the bar's door and soon Joker tells her that she is the best woman alive. When Harley opens the door, she tosses the money. But people in the bar seem cold and uninterested. Because of it, she asks if it is a funeral. She asks the bartender where KG is, and he tells her that KG catches a cold. Soon, Harley whispers to him that there is nobody named KG at the bar. Soon the bartender is about to attack her, but she defends faster. Because of it, the rest at the bar seems to want to attack her. She screams to Joker outside not to come inside the bar. She continues to fight with them when Joker wants to do something to save Harley. Some cars with explosive weapons attack Joker and he runs away. Meanwhile, Harley manages to defeat people in the bar. When she's looking for Joker, a girl with a katana comes. Harley tells her that she doesn't know what a samurai could have against little ol' her. Then they fight, but suddenly, Harley loses her weapon. It makes her use anything to defend her. Then Harley uses a pipe to defend her. Long story short, the girl stops the attack. Harley then asks her if she uses a flat iron, but suddenly the girl elbows Harley until she faints. Meanwhile, Amanda and her team are still trying to increase the load, but it makes the glasses around them break. Back to the scene about Harley. She is taken by the girl. Then the girl's men say sorry because Joker slipped through their fingers. Hearing that, Harley tells them that Joker will never get caught by chumps like them. Harley is also sure that she will find him. Because of it, she is kicked. On the other hand, Amanda manages to open the doorway to the new world. Then there is a scene about a half year after that. In the advanced research group uniting superhumans or Argus, Amanda seems to order unbelievable things. A guy looks not able to do her order, he tells her that the people are supervillains, which is the worst of the worst. He adds that it is going to come down on his head if anything goes wrong. Hearing that, Amanda asks if he is picking a fight with her. He says no, but Amanda thinks he has already got a major problem to answer for. It is because there is a discrepancy in the number of supplies coming into the asylum versus going out. Amanda suspects him and threatens him with the fact to shut up and do what she says. Then Amanda asks to open a door. It turns out the one in the room is Harley. Some officers are pointing a gun at Harley. After that, Amanda asks her to get out and tells her that she will do a job for her. Harley asks Amanda who she is since she doesn't know her. But because they are pointing a gun at her again, finally she obeys her. Before leaving the room, the guy earlier brings up a topic about how he treated her well and he asks her to at least thank you. 
But soon, Harley kicks him. She says that there is only one guy who gets free reign over her both romantically and physically. Because of it, Amanda uses an electricity tool, and she faints and she is taken by the officers. After that, Amanda asks to take her to the next cell. Again, he doesn't agree with Amanda. But Amanda says that it is impossible to change the world without embracing insanity. When Harley is awake, she is surprised that there is a guy named Deadshot who is far from her expectation. She expects Tweety's voice to be the first thing she wakes up to in the morning. On the other hand, Deadshot calls her a psycho chick. Soon, another guy named Clayfist tells him that there is no way to treat a woman who he has just met like that, because a real gentleman always carries himself with elegance. Because of it, Harley tells Clayfist that she is liking him already. But Deadshot wonders how he wears the same cloth as them then if nothing is wrong with the guy. Then the guy asks if they notice anything special about his face, but they don't notice anything and it makes him mad. Then Harley asks what is wrong with Peacemaker, because he is covered with a paper bag. Peacemaker then tells her that it is because people seeing his face could interfere with his noble mission. After that, Harley wonders about the mission. Peacemaker asks them if they know the reason they hauled them out there. He continues that they are on a mission for peace. He knows it because he doesn't put in work for anything else. Hearing that, Deadshot says that they have got a crazy mofo too. Then a guard comes in. Clayface asks him if they will be arriving soon. He adds, if it is going to be a long wait, he asks the guard to untie him. But the guard tells him that they arrived some time ago. The guard then asks them to listen to Amanda for a screen. Amanda informs them that they will work together with her agent named Adam to conduct the peace mission. She also says that the reward for success is a reduced sentence. So their mission is to establish and protect a series of bridgeheads that will serve as the framework for conducting research and resource acquisition in a certain region. Hearing that, Deadshot doesn't think that it is a simple job and he asks Amanda why they should work for her. Then Amanda answers because all of them had bombs implanted in their necks, she adds that she can trigger them to explode any time. Furthermore, they also work on a countdown. Unless it receives a radio signal sent from Amanda's end, the bomb is set to explode every 72 hours. In other words, any attempts to escape or ignore the orders that she gives to them will result in death. It makes them surprised. Denshot asks if they are supposed to wag their tails and be good doggies. Soon, Amanda says that Deadshot has a daughter. In an instant, he stands up angrily, he is mad at her. He threatens Amanda if she is getting closer to his daughter, she will be dead frigging meat. After that, Amanda orders them to follow the instructions Adam gives them. Then the guard tells them that their gear is stored in the wooden crates in back. He also asks them to prepare for the mission. He reminds them again about the bomb in the neck. But Harley asks him if he is still willing to blow her up if she clings into him. It makes him surprised, but Harley says that she is just kidding. Then Clayfus asks him who is the fifth person. He remembers Amanda mentioned there are five people already for the mission. When the guard is about to tell him, suddenly the emergency lamp and sound is on. He's about to go somewhere, but Harley asks him to let her loose. It turns out they are on a helicopter and the glass of the plane breaks. He asks for help from his team. But not so long after that, a helicopter crashes. The people around there notice that there is an explosion and wonder what it is. Meanwhile, Harley and the others take the advantage for escaping. They are trying to untie themselves. Then Harley manages to untie. After that, she tries to get out of the helicopter. But it is a cliff, she falls but luckily Deadshot saves her, and she gets back to the helicopter again. Then Clayfus uses his power to hit the helicopter's door. After manages to do it, he asks the rest to get out of there. Seeing that, Harley wonders if he is a metahuman, while Deadshot thinks no wonder he was the only one with that weird restraining device on him. When they start to walk, they see things like a dragon. Harley asks Clayfus if he had a part in the Lord of the Rings. Then there is a scene when there are people attacking a huge creature and a creature throws a guy in the cliff. Seeing that, Clayfus thinks it is a hardcore film set. Then Harley asks Peacemaker if it is the place for the peace mission and Peacemaker confirms it. Suddenly, they are about to be attacked by some creatures like pigs with spears and swords. Clayface, who thinks it is a filmmaking, explains that they are outsiders and asks where the producer is. But quickly, a creature attacks him. It makes Harley conclude that the creatures are not on her side. In an instant, a metahuman in the form of a shark comes and attacks the creature. Harley and the others also attack them. Long story short, in the middle of the fighting, Deadshot thinks that it is getting them nowhere and he wonders where the creature's boss is. Quickly, they find some big creatures of pig. Then Deadshot who is a professional assassin, is targeting the big pig. When the biggest pig falls, the rest of the pigs run away. Not so long after that, some people come. Seeing King Shark, who is still eating a creature, makes the people want to attack. But Deadshot shoots his sword, he then asks if they have been fighting the pigs too. After that, he explains that the shark is probably on their side too. 
Hearing that, the guy orders the sword to come itself. It makes King Shark on guard, but Clayfist tells him to not worry. Then Deadshot comes closer to the people and apologizes for frightening them. He also explains that they come in peace. But suddenly, Clayfist says that his life is boring and he feels God blesses him with a fantastic scenario at the moment. Hearing that, Harley wonders what's gotten into Clayfist. He says that there are dragons and orcs at the moment, an old-fashioned war fought with swords and arrows as well as magic. Furthermore, he calls it Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, but he believes that modern culture calls it Ice Guy. Meanwhile, Deadshot thinks that the noble cause is ridiculous. It makes Peacemaker triggered by what Deadshot said. Peacemaker tells him that he always sees his mission through to the end, and he asks Deadshot to not get in his way. Because of it, Deadshot brings up a topic about how he shot the biggest pig. On the other hand, Clayfist keeps talking to the people. He thinks that they are looking at the chosen warriors who were summoned from another world, then he asks them to bring him and the rest before their king. But it puts them in jail, not to mention that Deadshot and Peacemaker are still arguing about the peace mission. Then there is someone who informs about the new group of strangers in the kingdom. She thinks they are from another world. It turns out there is the girl from the previous scene who fought with Harley. Her name is Katana. There is a scene about a carriage bearing Queen Eldora rides towards the palace. Some people of the kingdom beg for food or to meet the queen but the guards hold them back. In the palace, the nobles are raving about their victory in the last battle thanks to Queen Aldora fighting on the front lines and raising the morale of their troops. The nobles call for a celebration. However, the knight leader Cecil retorts that there are still people of the kingdom who are starving, but the nobles ask why they should care because peasants are not important. They argue that they should reward the soldiers for a battle well fought and add that Cecil does not want to celebrate the glory of their queen. Queen Aldora stops their arguments and calls the nobles fools because winning a skirmish is not a victory. She says that their kingdom will only win when they destroyed every last one of the Empire of Brutes for good. Cecil points out a viewing window that plays back footage of Harley and the others fighting the orcs, asking the queen what they should do about them. Princess Fionn is really fascinated and keeps staring at Harley, possibly because they have similar faces. Meanwhile, the queen says that she heard their meddling has changed the tide of battle in the kingdom's favor. Cecil says the strangers were great fighters with incredible weapons, but he could not understand them, so he sent them to prison for the time being. Queen Aldora says to forget them because they are not important. Cecil says they can use them, or at least their weapons in war, but the queen says relying on outsiders' help is coerced, and then she puts an end to the meeting after commanding everyone to come prepared with a plan for the next battle by tomorrow's cabinet meeting. Princess Fionn tries to discuss the strangers with her mother, but Queen Aldora just says if she does not have any reliable information to share, she should keep quiet. Princess Fionn pouts in her room and uses a viewing window to see outside, feeling depressed when she sees how unhappy the people of the kingdom are and two children fighting over some bread. She ignores her plate of food even when her stomach growls. Cecil visits her and tells her that starving herself will not solve anything. The princess says that she has a favor to ask. Harley has a dream of her past when she was interrogated and brutalized by prison guards to the point she was losing consciousness, however. Joper came to rescue her. Then she wakes up to find herself in a cell with the others. King Shark is still asleep. Peacemaker says he has been keeping track and they have about 60 hours until the bombs in their heads go off and they have to go back to where their helicopter is before that happens. Clayfus keeps complaining that he does not like this ending and that in an Ice Kai story, the people who arrive in the New World are supposed to be treated as heroes, not criminals. He then uses his power to turn his body to clay so that he can slip through the bars and contemplates leaving the others behind. Feeling annoyed, Harley and Deadshot yell to get the guards' attention. The guards slap magical handcuffs on Clayfist that make him unable to use his powers and beat him up. Then one of the guards tells them to get out since it is lunchtime. In the cafeteria, they see all the other prisoners are monsters like orcs and ogres. Deadshot asks Clayfist if he is going to take them with him this time. But Clayfist says that he cannot do that, he cannot use his power since the guards put the magic cuffs on him. As they talk, an ogre approaches them saying that they are sitting at his personal table and orders them to move. Even though they cannot understand each other, Deadshot, who has been in prison long enough, understands what is going on. Clayfist tries to handle the situation. He attempts to calm the ogre down and negotiate with him, but he gets punched in the face instead because the ogre thinks that Clayfist is messing with him. The ogre reaches out for Clayfist's bowl, but Harley steals the bowl and drinks the soup. That makes the ogre enraged and starts a fight. Harley, Deadshot, and Peacemaker easily beat up the ogre and his gang. But then the guards come and pin them to the ground with the magic from their staves. The guards order all the strangers to be thrown into the disciplinary cell. King Shark, who is still sleeping, is also carried by the guards into the cell as well. Inside the cell, they find an Argus agent, Rick Flagg, who knows who they are. 
Flag asks them when and how they get there. Deadshot answers that they only got there the day before and that their helicopter crashed. Flag wonders if Amanda has sent them because she has decided to get serious. He then explains to them that they are not the first group who gets sent to this world. He explains that Amanda has sent him to lead another group of supervillains to this other world a few months ago, but he lost track of them and he has been in the prison ever since. Deadshot asks for what reason they are sent to this world and Flag says that they are willing to go anywhere to find water and natural resources for the benefits of their own country, even taking a risk of exploring totally unknown worlds and not being able to come back. Ben Deadshot gives a nickname to their group, the Suicide Squad. Peacemaker says their bombs have about 58 hours left and asks Flag how they can reset them. Flag says the first batch of supervillains did not have time bombs, but the area around the gate between their worlds should be able to receive Amanda's signal. He will lead them to it, but they can escape. Then King Shark wakes up hungry and threatens to eat them, but Flag, calling him by his real name, then now says the outside has better food, so King Shark breaks the door down. One of the guards comes to attack, but Deadshot flicks a pebble on the guard's eye, allowing Harley to steal his staff and smack him with it. As she does, she glows and she hits him hard enough to launch him into the ceiling, but then the staff breaks. Clayface steals the key to his magic cuffs and unlocks them, then he uses his power to unlock all the cells. He tries to give the inmates a speech to the other prisoners, but Peacemaker beats him to it and tells them all that now is the time for them to seek freedom. The prisoners understand his body language well enough and start a massive riot. Nanao eats several guards. The guards try to subdue them again with their magic staves, but Harley's newfound strength lets her break free and attack the guards, freeing the squad as well. The squad fights side by side with the ogre and his gang, having earned their respect. Eventually, they succeed in taking over the prison. Cecil rides a carriage along with some of his troops towards the prison. On the way, he recalls what Princess Fionn has asked him earlier. She wants to speak with that girl, Harley, and her group. Fionn points out what he said in the cabinet meeting that they were strong and that he sees they have the potential to turn the tide of battle. However, Cecil argues that they do not know who or what they are, and that what he meant is he was merely showing interest in their weaponry. Cecil says he turned their weapons over to the kingdom's technicians to take a closer look, but they could not figure them out. Princess Fionn pleads with Cecil to let her help in her way. She really wants to talk to them and to join forces with them so they can end the war as soon as possible. Upon arriving in front of the prison, Cecil is shocked to find the prison is covered with graffiti and all the former prisoners are partying. Harley spots the troops and says to the others that they have company. She and the others laugh because it will take more than that number of troops to take them down. In the midst of it all, an annoyed flag yells to them that they do not have time for this. There is a scene about Royal Army and the Wolfman face each other in a battle. The Royal Army starts to attack the Wolfman. On a cliff, Harley, Deadshot, and Peacemaker are observing the battle. Deadshot comments that both of the army are even in terms of the numbers. However, the royal troops are trying to take over the castle from the Wolfman, and Deadshot says that it is a bad move to attack the enemy head-on. The Wolfman have moves like a special force even though they are just beasts. Deadshot asks Peacemaker how much time they have left, and he answers that they have 30 hours. Deadshot wonders that that is not enough time for them to come up with a good plan of attack. Moreover, the Wolfman has got a top-notch commander. On the top of the castle, the Wolfman's commander watches over the fight looking down on the royal army and saying that they will not be able to wipe out his beasts. Cecil and his troops arrive at the prison gate. He is shocked by the state of the prison, but before Cecil can come close to the gate, he is intercepted by the squad. Cecil confronts the squad and yells at them for what they did to the prison. He exclaims that it is a rebellion against the kingdom. Clayface recalls that Cecil is the knight who had captured them. Harley and Deadshot mocks Cecil's receding hairline and laugh. Cecil feels insulted. Even though he doesn't understand what they say, he knows they are mocking him. He is so angry that he hurls his sword at Harley. However, Nanao catches the sword and swallows it. Cecil calls his sword back to his hand and it rips its way out of Nanao's stomach which horrifies the squad. Fortunately, Nanao glows and heals himself up. His stomach goes back to how it was. As the squad is about to fight Cecil and his troops, Flag stops them. He says that he has an idea and he will handle this. He has picked up the language from listening to the other prisoners since he has been in the prison longer than the squad. Then he tries to make a deal with Cecil by using their language which surprises Harley that he can do so. However, his speech is full of insults and swearing. The squad nemesis Cecil is getting more pissed off and asks if Flag really knows what he is saying. Flag tries again by saying the same words but Cecil has had enough and is about to attack, but he remembers what Princess Fionn has sent to him. Princess Fionn has requested to talk to Harley and the squad. She hopes to help end the fight as soon as possible. 
Cecil calms himself down and tells Flag and the squad to come with him. The squad is brought into the palace in chains and their heads covered. The nobles look down on them, especially Nanao for not being human. Then Queen Eldora and Princess Fionn enter the throne room. Fionn is surprised when she sees Harley, probably because she notices that they look alike. Queen Eldora casts a magic spell which allows them to understand each other. Flag speaks to Queen Eldora, requesting that they be given their freedom. Queen Eldora questions why she would do that. The noblemen also tell them to know their place. Flag apologizes for what they have done in the prison, and he says that they have information that can be useful to the queen. He asks for them to be set free in exchange for the information. Flag says that he knows the kingdom has been losing against the empire ever since they replaced the empire's generals who lead their forces. Flag informs that the new generals are from another world like them. The nobles get confused because they are unaware of the existence of other worlds. Harley and Deadshot say that now they understand Flag lost control of his first suicide squad and now they are running wild in this world. Aldora says this means is due to Flag's incompetence that the kingdom is endangered. She orders the guards to kill them all. But before things went south, Peacemaker eloquently tells the Queen that they are willing to atone for Flag's mistake. He says that they will fight on the kingdom's side. Queen Eldora eventually agrees but says until they prove their worth, she will keep Flag as a hostage and he will lose his head if they fail. As the guards drive Flag away, the squad mocks him. But he reminds them to get the job done, and that they need him to lead them to the gate or else they will explode. Deadshot tells Peacemaker to stop acting like he runs the show around here. Harley tells Queen Eldora that they need their stuff back and food for now now. The squad help themselves into each of their costumes and weapons. Clayfish asks Peacemaker if he will still wear a mask to which he answers that revealing his face can be bad for the mission. After they all get suited up, they go with Cecil and his troops to the fortress that has been taken over by Beastmen. Turns out Cecil is still angry about what happened earlier, so he orders the squad to stay on the sideline as he and his men will handle everything. He also tells the squad that they don't need help from outsiders. Cecil and his troops fight the Beastmen in an open combat using their swords, spears, and spells. The squad observes the fight from a cliff and Clayfish asks if they should help them. However, Deadshot says that Cecil has told them to stay put, so they would not want to hurt his pride by helping them. Clayfish adds that by helping them, it would see the squad in a new light like in the movies. Peacemaker also agrees with Deadshot saying that the troops only get in the way of the mission. Deadshot wonders how these wolfmen have been trained, but hardly notices that the wolfmen are brainwashed. She notices some wolfmen are injured, but they are ignoring their injuries and still fight despite their own pain. Clayfish comments that Harley seems to know what she is talking about, to which Harley responds that she has got first-hand experience of brainwashing before. Deadshot thinks to himself that the brainwashing and the obedient animals sounds familiar. Then he tells the squad to follow him since he gets the idea of who the commander is. Deadshot says that he will listen to what he says since he has helped the commander from getting harassed countless times. The squad attempts to sneak to the fortress. Clayfish opens a hole in the wall, saying ever since he came to this world, he feels like there is some kind of magic power flowing through him. He says that his powers have improved, giving him power over clay. Before, he has experimented and he can only manipulate clay on his body, but in this world it seems that he can work on any sort of clay. Harley also realizes that, that is why she has become stronger. The squad storms the fortress, killing every wolfman in the way. At the top of the fortress, they meet Ratcatcher. Deadshot happily greets him saying he's a friend from prison, but Ratcatcher is really pissed off to see him. Deadshot narrates how he looked out for Ratcatcher in prison, but he is oblivious that his actions were actually bullying Ratcatcher as well. Deadshot wonders why Ratcatcher is angry while the squad is disgusted by his actions. Pissed off, Ratcatcher brandishes a staff that gives him control over other creatures, an improvement over his power to control rats, and commands the wolfman to kill the squad. As they fight, Peacemaker tries to shoot Ratcatcher, but a wolfman uses himself as a shield, so he gets shot instead. Harley blames Deadshot for getting into this mess, but he just asks Ratcatcher what has he done to upset him, which makes Ratcatcher get angrier. Clayfus points out the water towers and Deadshot shoots them. Now that the floor is wet, Clayfus collapses the fortress to take out all the wolfmen. Peacemaker tries to shoot Ratcatcher again, but Katna appears and parries the bullet, then she grabs Ratcatcher and jumps over the side, escaping. Harley is very angry to see her again. Without Ratcatcher to control them, the wolfmen are defeated. However, Cecil gets upset and berates the squad for disobeying his orders and ruining the fortress, but Deadshot dismissively says they have the fortress back now and all it will all be fine after some repairs and cleaning. The squad walks away leaving a very upset Cecil. In the palace, Queen Aldora, Princess Fionn, and the nobles have been watching the battle on a viewing screen. 
Princess Fion says that she was right. The squad can help them turn the tide of the war. In a cave, Katana tells Ratcatcher that it will be the only time she helps him. She reminds him how the Emperor feels about failure. They have lost the fortress and the Emperor will not tolerate it. Ratcather says that it will not happen again. He will make the squad suffer by showing them what he is really made of. All he needs are stronger creatures and takes control of some giant bats inside the cave. The episode begins with a flashback scene focused on Gotham City, where some thugs are entering a building. They are looking for the Joker. At the same time Joker is watching those thugs on his screen, Harley is with him as well. As the thugs search the building for him, they open a door to a room and shoot, but Joker is not in that room. Meanwhile, Joker and Harley are discussing how the dirty rats in the city like the gangs are the gutter trash of society for their actions. Joker adds that they just shoot places up, steal money and kidnap people. Then Joker begins to explain the best way to hunt them down. The thugs find some footprints that they assume belong to Joker and Harley. However, the scene shifts focus to Harley and the squad in the other world, where she's waking up in a cell. Rick Flagg and the other Suicide Squad members are also in the same cell with her. They are just silent when Harley greets them. Flagg asks the squad if they really have done the job well since they were promised to be set free if they bring a good result. Deadshot interrupts Flagg's ranting saying that the job is done. They might have gone a little overboard, but they got rid of the Wolfman. It is revealed by Peacemaker that they only have 12 hours and 8 seconds left before their bombs explode when they are visited by Princess Fion. Clayfish tries to sweet-talk her but Deadshot interrupts, asking her when they will be set free. However, Fion unfortunately reveals she has no idea when they will be let out. But since they contributed in retaking the kingdom's fort, they should be treated well. Princess Fion also apologizes to them for not being able to do much. Princess Fion then looks at Harley, which is noticed by the latter. Harley asks her if she has something to say to her since the princess seems so interested in her since the first time they met. Harley says that the look Fion has been giving just rubs her the wrong way. She adds that Fion's timid personality also bothers her, saying Fion reminds her of a wimpy brat she used to know. Harley is most likely talking about her former self as Harleen Quinzel. At that moment, Cecil arrived calling for the princess and telling her that she should not be there without an escort. Then, Cecil tells the Suicide Squad that the Queen has requested an audience with them. A flashback scene is shown about Princess Fion's childhood, where she is shown to be friends with several commoners, a young boy, a young she-elf, and a wolf boy. They are standing on top of a tower building overlooking the peaceful view of the village and the subjects. They are all mesmerized by the tranquil view. The boy says that that particular spot is his favorite, since it has the best view. The boy knows that Fion is in disguise as a commoner, so he tells her to quit the fancy talk. The boy reveals that the price of the bread has hiked up again. Not long after that, a younger version of Cecil comes and calls out to Fion that she needs to go back soon or she will get scolded. Back at the palace, young Fion is berated for her action by her mother, a queen. The queen reminds her that they are members of royalty who have a higher status and different duty from the peasants, then she tells Fion to clean herself up. As the queen starts to leave, Fion asks her what their duty is as royalty, to which the queen says to bring an end to the war. It is then revealed that one of Fion's friends, the boy, died shortly thereafter, likely due to the war. Fion is seen standing on her friend's grave under heavy rain, sadness clouding her face. The scene then returns to the present, where Princess Fion is brought back to the present by Cecil who tells her that it is time for a war council. Cecil tells her that there is no need for her to be at the council, but Fion is adamant to attend the war council. The situation in the war council gets tense as it is revealed that a great number of the imperial army is marching, albeit at a slow pace, towards the recently reclaimed fortress. Cecil informs that the guards posted at the fortress will not be enough to hold them off. The Imperial Army will force their way across the bridge within a day or two if there is no action to be taken. Harley then interrupts the council and asks why she and the others are still shackled, under the impression they would be set free as a part of the deal after reclaiming the fortress. Some of the nobles yell at her for speaking up in the war council. The Queen also adds it is clear that this is due to their destroying the fort rather than reclaiming it, which shuts Harley up quickly. The Queen asks Flag regarding the general who is commanding the marching Imperial forces and how they can command the Beastmen. However, Flag answers with a question of his own on the sequence of events leading up to the war so he can have a better understanding of the enemy's situation. On the Queen's commands, Cecil explains that the Kingdom has been waging war against the Imperial forces for many decades now, with the intensity increasing drastically in the last six months after the Elves and Beastmen betrayed the Kingdom and switched sides to the Empire. Cecil reveals that the beastmen they fought the other day were originally members of the Queen's Kingdom. Clayfish says that perhaps the elves and the beastmen betrayed them simply because they do not care for the Kingdom, 
to which Deadshot agrees seeing how they treat their war heroes referring to how they are treated. This information satisfies Flag enough to reveal that Ratcatcher is the one behind the Beastman's betrayal. He also explains Ratcatcher's powers to the Queen and asserts that he is leading the army. Then the Queen asks how they can stop the army, but Flag does not have the answer to that yet. Deadshot asks Flag why he did not just blow Ratcatcher's head off after he went rogue and Flag says that the bombs got diffused without him noticing which probably prompts director Amanda Waller to make sure to include a countdown on the squad's bombs. The Queen is about to throw the squad and Flag back to prison when Harley then shouts out something about hunting rats while also thanking Joker, or as she likes to call Puddin, excitedly, remembering the conversation she was dreaming of with him earlier regarding a good way to get rid of rats. The scene then jumps ahead in time to after the Suicide Squad have seemingly come up with a plan. Peacemaker comments that they do not have enough forces to execute this plan since it requires them to not only stop Ratcatcher's army, but also force him to the front lines. This prompts Flag to ask the Queen to let them borrow some of the Kingdom's forces, while also demanding their freedom that has been promised upon their victory. The nobles strongly argue against the idea. However, Princess Fionn steps up to the Queen saying it would be beneficial and show some trust to Flag and the squad. Cecil and the others initially reject this idea saying it would be too reckless and also due to a lack of forces, but Harley argues that they have plenty of soldiers to use. This leads to the reveal that the prisoners whom the Suicide Squad staged their breakout with will be joining them in the fight against the Imperial Army. It seems that Harley is now chummy with the Ogre they had a quarrel with, and she clearly has command over the other monsters. She orders them to work hard in the fight so they can be free, otherwise they will go back straight into prison. Meanwhile, Flag is sending a very reluctant Clayfus on a mission and generally trying to get the other Suicide Squad members under control. Then, Flag is approached by Cecil, who asks if it does not bother them to fight alongside criminals like the Suicide Squad since he is a soldier. Even though he's not happy about it, Flag says he just has to follow the orders as a soldier. Later that night, Clayfus returns after setting up some barriers. Cecil, Flag, and the squad, minus Deadshot, discuss the game plan for the battle. Cecil asks about Deadshot's whereabouts and the others say that he is up on the roof preparing for the battle. Clayfish asks Cecil about what Princess Fion is like since he gets the impression that she wanted to ask the squad something. Cecil says that she is a kind-hearted person and that no one in the castle cares for the subjects of the kingdom as much as she does. However, Harley thinks otherwise saying that Fion is just a whiny loser who is too busy hating herself, prompting Cecil to defend the princess's honor. As Cecil keeps going on about the princess, King Shark begins smelling the arrival of the enemy forces, signaling the start of the battle. Cecil declares that he will command the knights on the front lines and orders the Suicide Squad to fight and lead the Ogres. However, Harley argues that they do not need to do anything since the Ogres are totally ready for action. The other members also do not feel like doing what Cecil is telling them. It seems that they have something else in their pocket. Cecil gets irritated and leaves the squad to join his troops. On the battlefield, Ratcatcher, who blends in with the marching beastmen, notices the barriers that Clayfus had made and the Ogres, seemingly realizing their plan. Cecil then gives a speech before leading his troops into battle, reminding them of their duty. Meanwhile, Ratcatcher merely uses his magic to send his troops into battle while ranting about the demais he will bring to Deadshot. As Ratcatcher is commanding his troops to charge, at that moment Deadshot fires a shot into the crowd Ratcatcher is in, seemingly missing him. However, Deadshot really did hit his target all along, which is the magic crystal on Raycatcher's staff, which gives him command upon the beastmen. Ratcatcher does not realize this at first, he just laughs and commands the beasts to go after the target, Deadshot, on the top of the fort. However, he seems to lose his control over the beasts since they do not move an inch. That is when he realizes that his magic crystal has been destroyed. A flashback begins which reveals that this is the squad's true plan all along to lure Ratcatcher into the open and target his magical staff. Ratcatcher is then cornered and attacked by the Beastmen. Then the flashback starts again of Joker and Harley from earlier on in the episode about the way to get rid of rats, which is by making them feed on each other. Joker had tricked two groups of thugs who were searching for him into killing each other. Deadshot joins the rest of the squad after succeeding his mission. Harley praises him on the job well done to which he just brags that Ratcatcher was just like 700 meters away from them so it was an easy shot. Then he asserts to the squad again that he did Ratcatcher so many favors in the past, but he only gets a nice stab on his back in return. The beastmen who are finally free from Ratcatcher's magic get confused as to what they are doing at that place, and eventually they are willing to surrender. The Suicide Squad come to where Cecil is, saying that they are free to do what they want now since they already beat the enemy. Cecil, who is still confused about what has happened, wants some explanation however the squad does not give any. The Suicide Squad and Rick Flagg then took their leave after fulfilling their end of the deal. 
The report about the battle that has been won reaches the palace, amazing the War Council with their victory. However, as Princess Fionn is about to say something to her mother, she notices something amiss. The Queen is seemingly angry at these results, as the episode ends with a focus on Rascalan face and Princess Fionn who is confused by the Queen's reaction. It seems like the Queen has expected the opposite outcome which totally comes as a twist. Rick Flagg and the Suicide Squad rush over to the location of the gate. When they arrive there, they do not see the gate. Flagg notices that the gate is over the river, it is green and releases some kind of signal. Deadshot exclaims how they are supposed to reach the gate since it is far up and there is nothing they can use to reach it. He asks Nanao to let him climb up on him, but Nanao refuses. Then, Harley notices that all of the squad's necks are flashing, and she wonders if it's a bad sign. Getting anxious, Deadshot asks Flag to stop the time bomb on their necks. However, Flag cannot do that since he has no control over whether they get reset or not. Then, Clayfish asks how they are supposed to reset the timer, to which Flag responds that they pray. Pray that the reset signal is making its way to that world from the other side. Peacemaker informs them that based on his estimation, they have only a few seconds left until the timer is up and the bomb on their heads goes kaboom. That comes as a shock to the squad. If their heads are still intact after waiting for a few seconds, then that means the signal has been sent. Deadshot asks how much longer they got and Peacemaker only responds by counting down from 6, which really makes Deadshot terrified, exclaiming that he should have told them earlier while Peacemaker continues to count. Look. When Peacemaker reaches 1 on his counting, the red flashing of the bombs on their neck stops and becomes green. The bombs stop beeping before the green light goes out as well. The Suicide Squad is still alive even though the timer on the bombs has already stopped. Guess the people from the other side do not just leave them for dead. Since they are good for now, Harley asks if anyone is hungry and now and Deadshot agree. However, Flag reminds the squad that the timer needs to be reset every 72 hours and tells them to stay sharp. He adds that since they were not killed off, it means that they are expected to finish the mission. Harley does not understand what Flag means, so he explains about the mission to establish and protect bridgeheads that are meant to serve as the framework for resource acquisition and research soon. Flag tells the squad to keep in mind that the only reason why they are still alive is the mission that they have to accomplish. He also adds that their top priority for the time being is to establish a good relationship with the people of the kingdom. They have to start by helping the kingdom to end the war. All of the Suicide Squad members agrees that they are in on the mission. They fight alongside the Kingdom's army of knights in reclaiming the territories. After one of their battles, the Suicide Squad along with Flag and Cecil gather in a place surrounded by giant mushrooms. They sit in silence, except Deadshot who keeps grunting while firing his gun that has run out of ammo, seemingly not in good mood. Clayfish says that by doing that will not make more bullets magically appear. His comment annoys Deadshot and the latter says that he has been frugal with the bullets but nothing lasts forever. But Clayfist does not entirely agree with what Deadshot said as frugal. Then out of nowhere, Harley starts shooting up one of the giant mushrooms with her gun, making a heart shape with the bullets which ends up annoying Deadshot more. Steasel says that he is actually relieved that Deadshot will not have access to his dirty weapons anymore. Deadshot is offended by Cecil's comment which insinuates that using a gun is dirty, and he tells Cecil to challenge the enemies to a duel with a glove slap if he wants to fight fair and square. Flag tells Deadshot to cut it out and apologizes to Cecil for Deadshot's comment, saying that there is no fixing him. Clayfist is concerned since Peacemaker and Harley also use guns as their weapon of choice, so the problem will not only affect Deadshot but also will affect the rest of the group. Harley says that in the worst case scenario, they can just use frying pans as their weapons, and that will do it. She adds that in zombie movies, whoever has got the frying pan is always the strongest. Peacemaker comments that there is no zombie there, to which Harley says that if the frying pan can beat zombies, it can beat anything. This ridiculous idea does not impress Clayfus at all. Then Flag says that he has an idea. He says that he was originally sent to this world as part of an advanced team. His team did not crash when they first arrived there, which means that the helicopter they arrived in and their gear should still be in one piece. Knowing that Deadshot is eager to get the show on the road to find the helicopter, saying that he cannot do anything without any ammo. However, Flag says that the only problem is that the helicopter landed on a mountain that is over on the west side, so they will have to go back to the fort first. Peacemaker also says that even if they leave now, they will not get there until nightfall. But Deadshot does not care about that, and he is going whether they like it or not, saying he needs bullets. Harley stops Deadshot on his way, asking if they can start the journey until after she takes a bath. And that silences everyone. On their way to the fort, Harley complains that nobody told her the baths are so far away. Deadshot just replies by saying that they are almost there. Fly also says that they will have to wait until the next morning to head for the helicopter, and they will stay the night at the fort. 
When they arrive at the fort, they are welcomed by one of the former inmates who informs them that they are about to throw a dinner party and tell the group to come and join them. As they join in on the dinner party, Harley asks one of the inmates what is the occasion for the party and he says that Cecil, whom he calls a loud and obnoxious knight, gave them some booze as a reward for fighting. The squad wonders what brought that on. But one of the monsters says they have no idea and that there is no sense letting the reward go to waste. Harley asks if that is not such a raw deal since the army just dragged the monsters out to fight a war. However, the monster says that it does suck at first, but not anymore since they are told they could have free reign of the place in exchange for fighting on the front lines as long as the Empire does not take control of it. They also say that it does not feel half bad to have the kingdom depend on them. The squad thinks that it is stupid just because the kingdom showed them a little kindness, but Beanstalk, the giant ogre, just says that they cannot relate to how those monsters feel. The next morning, the squad and flags say goodbye to the monsters. One of them hands over a frying pan to Harley since apparently she has asked for it. One monster also says that they will hold the fort. The group journey on their way to where the helicopter is. They have to walk through the forest and climb up the mountain, until they see the summit, and something is flying over it, which Harley assumes is a bird. Turns out, it is not a bird at all, but it is a dragon. It is making a nest using the helicopter. This complicates things even more. Clayfis says that they are a team of weaklings with crappy gear which is not exactly ideal for slaying dragons. Deadshot says to give him a crossbow since he saw people use one to kill a dragon in Game of Thrones. Flag tells the squad that they cannot just give up and go back now since the helicopter is fully loaded with weapons and ammo. Deadshot tells Flag to stop telling them what to do and that no one is backing out. Clayfus comes to action saying as he has to step up the plate and tell the others to just stand back and watch. Then he transforms himself into some sort of flying hybrid creature even the squad cannot figure out what he is transformed into. It seems that he transforms himself to get the dragon's attention, however, he does not get any so he changes back. Deadshot mocks him by saying that he keeps saying he is a big shot actor but he cannot even win over a dragon. That triggers Clayfus to start arguing with him. As they both keep arguing, the dragon approaches them. Harley notices this and alerts the others. The group run for their life as the dragon shoots out fire to all of them. It is a very tough fight against the dragon since the group does not have any weapon to protect themselves, only Haley with her frying pan. The group is running out of auctions to fight the dragon, and Flag says he will figure out a plan. At that moment, the dragon comes from behind them and Nanal is captured. The dragon tries to eat Nanal but he gives a good fight. The squad comments that they do not expect the dragon would choose fish over meat however, Flag tells them to stop clowning around and save Nanal. Deadshot looks at a single bullet in his hand which seems to be his very last ammo. Clayfitz conjures up a wall using his power, blocking the dragon, and he tells Flag to use this chance to get to the weapons. Peacemaker comes with Flag. Deadshot readies his weapon with his last bullet to try and save Nanao. He fires the shot aiming at the dragon's eye, but the dragon manages to close her eye at the last second. Then the dragon shoots fire towards the squad and Nanao also gets out in the process but he is engulfed in fire. The dragon attacks again but thanks to Clayfist they are safe and fortunately, Nanao also survives. The dragon manages to destroy the barricade Clayfus made and starts to attack again. But then Harley uses her frying pan to evade the dragon fire so that it fires back to the dragon. However, it is not the end yet since the dragon attacks again using her tail. Harley is almost in harm's way if not for Deadshot saving her in the nick of time, and as he runs while carrying an unconscious Harley he screams to Flag and Peacemaker to hurry and get the weapons. Harley then comes to life again seemingly not hurt at all and goes on her way to check on Flag and Peacemaker. On the summit, Flag and Peacemaker make it to the helicopter and find that none of the weapons get damaged. Peacemaker tells Flag to grab whatever they can use before walking away. Flag finds a satellite telephone and hides it from Peacemaker. Then Harley shows up and she notices a hand rocket. On the other hand, Deadshot is still fighting for his life as he is chased and attacked by the dragon. Harley calls for Deadshot throwing the hand rocket at him. Peacemaker tries to distract the dragon as Deadshot goes to get the weapon. Clayface traps the dragon which gives Deadshot the chance to shoot the dragon. He successfully fires his shot and gets the dragon's neck, defeating the dragon. Deadshot almost falls over the cliff in the process but he is saved by Nanao. They all gather at the helicopter and check out all the weapons and ammo. Clayface asks Peacemaker how he got the dragon to stop to which he answers that he uses its egg, taking out the egg as he is saying that. He says that he will make an omelet next time as he has never tasted dragon egg before. However, Harley disapproves since it is cruel, and then she takes the egg from Peacemaker's hands. She holds the egg close and coos and in that moment, the egg starts to hatch. A baby dragon appears to which Harley gets really excited. 
it is clear that the baby dragon thinks Harley is its mom. Deadshot says that it will be dangerous when the baby dragon becomes huge like its mom, but Harley pays no mind to that, saying that is just a cute little guy for now. Then she names the baby dragon Arthur, and the baby dragon seems to like it. As the squad is busy with the baby dragon, Flag moves away to contact director Amanda Waller. He informs her that he is currently accompanying Harley and her group, and that they have established an amicable relationship with the kingdom. Director Amanda orders him to continue with the plan and asks about the advanced team. Flag says that unfortunately they have all joined the enemy ranks. Then the director tells him to get rid of them all. Flag has no option but to copy that. Peacemaker tries to find out if they can get the helicopter running however it seems that it is not going anywhere since the dragon has made a real mess of it. They need to go back on foot. Flag asks the group to pack up and leave. Flag and the squad make their way back along with the baby dragon. However, as they are arriving at the fort, Harley smells like something funny. Flag seems to figure it out and runs ahead. He finds the fort has been burned down and Beanstalk and the others are nowhere in sight. The Thinker and Enchantress appear, it seems like they are behind all of this. The squad and Flag have arrived at the fort, but they are stunned by the condition of the place. They stop at a cliff looking over the already destroyed fort. Harley steps forward and she sees all of the monsters are murdered. She is shocked when she notices Beanstalk, the ogre who is seen crawling in pain. He is covered in blood and it trails behind him. Then the figure appears standing over Beanstalk. The figure steps their foot on one of the sharp green crystals sticking out on Beanstalk's body. The figure, who turns out to be an elf, hurts Beanstalk more by doing that. Beanstalk groans in pain. The female elf raises her sword aimed at Beanstalk. Harley yells Beanstalk's name and he hears her. However, it is already too late as the elf strikes Beanstalk's head, murdering him. After beheading Beanstalk, the female elf turns back as her earring glints under the moonlight. Her eyes show that she is in some kind of a trance or influence. Harley, who is in shock, wonders who those assholes are. Flag approaches her but Harley just turns back and hands Arthur the baby dragon over to him. Harley looks so furious. The rest of the squad gets suited up, as well as Harley with her big frying pan, ready to charge at the enemies. Flag tries to stop them from jumping the gun as the squad runs and jumps over the cliff. The elf people hear the squad approaching. Harley appears from the dark as she drags her frying pan. Then, in a heartbeat, the elves charge towards her. They run at a lightning speed. As one of the female elves gets near Harley, she gets shot on her leg, making her fall to the ground and bleeding out. In the next second, Nana attacks one male elf, bringing him to the ground and killing him. Harley approaches the elf that has gotten shot. She is still alive and bleeding out. Harley takes out her baseball bat, seemingly ready to finish her off. On the side, another female elf watches the scene, raising her magic staff. Before she gets to unleash her magic, Peacemaker stops her by pointing his gun behind her head, as he tells her to not mess with the piece in front of him. The elf turns her head to stare at Peacemaker, with her blue enchanted eyes and glinting earring that seems to surprise Peacemaker. From the sky, a green light appears, and the next thing happens is an explosion that almost gets Peacemaker, but fortunately he manages to survive by using the elf as a shield. Peacemaker looks over to the sky where a round giant green crystal appears. Someone else seems to be in control of it. That someone turns out to be the Enchantress and a second after, the Thinker shows up floating in the air. The giant green crystal ball breaks, sending sharp crystal shards onto the squad, clearly this is Enchantress doing. An army of elves show up behind Enchantress. The Thinker comes down onto the seat that is carried by the elves. As he sits down, he looks down on Peacemaker, Harley and Nanao in arrogance, while the three of them look back at him in anger. The Thinker calls them a bunch of uncouth clowns as Enchantress appears near him. As the Thinker continues to speak, a bullet appears out of nowhere, but it bounces back due to an invisible magic shield protecting the Thinker. It is revealed that Deadshot is the one behind the flying bullet aim at Thinker. On a green crystal next to Deadshot, the Thinker's reflection appears as he mocks the squad, saying that their lack of intelligence is evident not only in how they look, but also in how they act. Deadshot points his gun to the crystal, showing the Thinker as he complains that now they have to deal with a witch and a mad scientist, after they just fought a dragon. The Thinker asks Deadshot if he knows about him and Deadshot denies saying that with that kind of jetup, it clearly tells that he is a mad scientist. In the middle of their talk, something is shown crawling underground among the army of elves. Harley questions what they both want and she says that it is pretty obvious that they are one of the Empire's flunkies. Harley also asks if they are here to get even with the squad about what happened to their rodent friend, Ratcatcher. However, the Thinker says that he couldn't care less about Ratcatcher, calling him a nobody. Peacemaker is shown holding grenades behind his back and pulls out their safety. Meanwhile, 
Deadshot zeroes in on Enchantress as his next target. Enchantress says that the fort has fallen, so there is no point in them fighting against each other there. Harley just tells her to cut the crap. She looks over to the lifeless bodies of the ogres and monsters, before pointing her bat to the Thinker and Enchantress, and she says she is going to end them. The Thinker and Enchantress seems a little taken aback by Harley. Then Peacemaker throws his grenades towards the Thinker, and on the other hand, Deadshot also pulls the trigger. His bullet hits one of the grenades and they explode. However, the explosion did nothing to the Thinker, and it only left him surrounded by black smokes. Harley jumps through the black smoke trying to attack the Thinker, but the shield is protecting him again. Then the Thinker controls one of the elves to attack Harley using her magic staff, and Harley gets thrown over. The Thinker arrogantly says that after knowing that guns will not work on him, the squad charge in brute force. As he is saying that Clefus, who turns out to be the one who is crawling underground, gives the army of elves a surprise attack from behind, but they manage to block him. The Thinker says that the attacks are very obvious. Then he uses his power to control the elf forces who have magic staff all at once. He also says that even the most incompetent bunch could become useful soldiers if he links their brains together. Nanao charges to attack, but the Thinker commands the elves to fire at Nanao. Even though ending up with scratches, Nanao still stands strong. He tries to charge at them again, but this time Enchantress gets on his way. She holds Nanao back with her crystal power surrounding her as a shield. Still, Nanao manages to sink his sharp teeth through the barrier. Realizing that Nanao almost breaks her shield, Enchantress brings Nanao up and makes her shield explode, sending Nanao to fall into the waters. Deep in the water, Nanao is attacked by Killer Croc. He hits Nanao out of nowhere, strong enough that he bleeds out. Then Killer Croc tells another monster to attack Nanao. Nanao is trapped by the monster's tentacles. The monster throws Nanao, but as he gets his balance again, Killer Croc shows up and starts beating him again. However, Nanao still gives a good fight back and he manages to subdue. But alas, the monster approaches again to attack Nanao and Killer Croc holds Nanao, so he cannot move. This is obviously far from a fair fight, one against two. At the same time, Harley is also fighting the elves as they charge her one by one, but still she is able to defeat them. From afar, the magic elves fire at Harley, but she takes cover. Then Deadshot shoots them right on the head, killing some of them. He also shoots up other elves who try to attack him. Peacemaker and Clefus also fight together with him. Clefus says that the army of elves keep coming as the squad starts to get overwhelmed. Meanwhile, Flag is still nowhere to be seen. Another troop of magic elves prepare to attack the squad again under the Thinker's mind control. Harley says that there is a reason why she despises smarmy eggheads. The Thinker says that it is no good to provoke him, then he uses his power to get into the squad's mind, except Harley. Flashes of their dark past play out in Clefus, Deadshot, and Peacemaker's mind. Harley tries to tell the others to snap out of it, but it seems like they are stuck in their mind. The Thinker approaches, still on his throne with the army of elves. He braggingly asks if Harley still thinks that he is all talk and no action as he laughs evilly. Enchantress appears asking him what he is doing, and she tells him to stop making the squad suffer. She adds that she thought he likes to keep things classy. The Thinker just begrudgingly says that wise men such as him have a duty to educate and discipline the foolish. Then he shoots Deadshot, Peacemaker, and Clefus after he says that there is no cure for stupidity. Harley is shocked. Enchantress comes to her and tells her to give up and walk away, however, Harley still has a fight left in her. She attacks Enchantress and tells her to stop acting like a boss as she is just another ass kisser for the Empire. Enchantress says that it is only a temporary alliance, she doesn't care for Argus nor the Empire. Harley tells her that she is just moving from one scumbag to another as she is doing the Empire's dirty work when she doesn't even like them. Harley adds that she really despises people like Enchantress. That seems to provoke Enchantress as she uses her full power to attack Harley that she blacks out. In her unconscious state, Harley dreams of Joker who tells her to get her act together, and that it would be a buzzkill for her and him if she died there. As she gains her consciousness, she can faintly hear Flag tell Thinker and Enchantress to back off, or they want to get their heads blown off instead. However, the Thinker only calls Flag to be another idiot, since if it was even remotely possible to blow off their head, then he would have triggered their bombs when they first got separated a few months ago. Flag says that his orders are to catch them alive if possible and challenges them if they would like to test him, holding the trigger to their bombs. Killer Croc appears bringing a beaten up Nana with him. The Thinker relents, saying as they have wiped out their fortress, an average human like Flag is helpless at this point even with Harley and Nana on his side. Then he flies up and disappears into the sky along with Enchantress and Killer Croc. Meanwhile, the army of elves are either knocked out or dead after they are free from the Thinker's mind control. Flag asks Harley what happened, but there is no answer. 
He finds Harley sobbing over the other members' lifeless bodies. Flag is surprised, not really believing that Harley and Nanao are really the only ones left. Harley says that they are all dead as she sobs. But then Clayfa says that she gets the pose all wrong despite nailing the lamenting sobs. Harley and Flag are stunned seeing him still alive. Clayface reveals that the bullets stopped for some reason and he is not sure if it was divine intervention or something else. Then he hits Deadshot and Peacemaker in her face to wake them up. Clayface asks Deadshot if he rigged his gun but he says no. Deadshot looks at the bullet which glows green before the light fades. Back at the palace, the squad and Flag are back in the prison. Cecil comes saying that he heard the news of their miserable defeat. Flag says sorry and that the enemies have outclassed them. In the council meeting, the novelmen look at the screen showing the army of elves as they panic. Queen Eldora silences them and tells them not to panic. She says that there is no denying that they lost their fort in the battle, but they did not lose anything else besides some lowly prisoners, which is nothing to fuss about. Princess Fion looks down in sadness and disappointment. The queen adds if their knights had been in charge of the fort from the beginning, then things would not have turned into such a mess. And the blame is entirely on whoever let the prisoners out, which is Flag and the squad. That surprises Fion and the Queen gives orders to hang them all. Fion tries to argue saying that executing them won't do anything to improve the situation. The Queen says that it will keep their military in line and send the message to the populace that they must protect the Cayman with their own hands. The noblemen agree. Skisil finds out about the execution order. He tells Fion that that is just ridiculous. It is true that the Kingdom relied on the squad a little too much but executing them won't change anything. Fion tells Cecil that her mother once told her that ending the war is the duty of royalty, but she feels that her mother willingly let anger towards the squad cloud her judgment earlier. Fion is not sure if she can trust her mother anymore. Cecil asks her what her personal feelings towards the Otherworlders are. He says that it is clear to him that she has some attachment to those people. Fiona says that she doesn't know and that perhaps she is driven to want to believe them. Cecil reveals that he himself may have grown attached to them and says that he has an idea. In the prison, Flag says that it is their fault they are out there showing all sorts of chaos in this world. Deadshot doesn't agree saying that Argus and Flag are to blame. Arthur, the baby dragon, shows up at the prison's window. He tries to breathe out fire to help them escape, but to no avail. Then Cecil comes saying that they have to keep it down if they are planning a prison break, then he goes to unlock their cell and tells them to get out. He says that they need to leave and fight the Empire again to prove they are worth keeping around. He informs them that the Queen intends to have them executed, and they have to convince them otherwise. Deadshot just laughs and asks him if this is his way of trying to save their life by forcing them to fight the Empire again. However, Cecil says that it wouldn't be right to execute them as they have risked their life for a kingdom that owes them nothing. He reveals that he lost his fiance in this war and he reminds them there must be other people waiting for them to come home. Flag says that he never figures the squad were such cowards, noticing that the thinker has pried into their minds. He asks them if they have cold feet because they got spooked by the thinker's mind games. Deadshot starts to argue, but Fion comes and tells him to keep it down. She is also in on this too, and she tells Cecil that they are running out of time. As the others get out of the cell, Harley is still not moving as she asks Fion if she really wants to do this. Fion answers that she doesn't know, but she says that it is easy to just do what she is told, but she is not sure that is the right choice. She adds that it feels wrong to act the same as she did in the past. As Flag and the squad already left the cell, Fion asks Cecil if that was really the right thing to do or if she has made another mistake. Cecil says be that as it may and his duty is to stay by her side and support her. Flag says that the palace is caught onto the squad's escape as the bell is rung, and they get into a carriage. Harley asks what the plan is and Peacemaker says that he just finished formulating a strategy. Meanwhile, the Thinker and his army of elves are at the gate to the other world. He finds out that the squad need to visit the gate regularly to pick up a signal for their bombs after he looked into their minds before. The elves seem to be doing some magic and a fortress comes out of the ground on the spot where they are casting their magic. This is the end of Suicide Squad Aizkai Episode 6. Thank you so much for staying in this channel and watching our videos. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel so we can keep you updated with our latest contents. See you in the next video.